Hello, my name is Andrew. My wife and I lead the Broadview campus and it's great to be with you at Church Online today. I'm the owner of a two-year-old red healer named Scout. We love Scout in, in our family, but he is a puppy mind in an adult body. He's affectionate, um, but he's stubborn and still in need of much much training. It can be quite embarrassing when we're at the park sometimes. And if you've seen the movie Marley and Me, our life with our puppy isn't really that far off from their experience. And one of the things I'm trying to teach him and sometimes failing to teach him is to wait. You know, you have that treat that he loves and you get him to sit or to, to lie down and then you walk away to a place on the ground with the command to wait until I call him to come and to eat it. I see other owners do this and they can get their dogs to do all sorts of things, roll over and talk and shake hands and all that sort of stuff. I just want him to learn to wait. Sometimes he does it and then I feel like I've made some amazing breakthrough and then sometimes he just doesn't see the point in it. I mean, why would you wait? The food is right there and it is delicious and you can smell it and you can see him, his, his whole jowl is you know, salivating. Why would you wait? The food is right there. But I want him to learn the skill because I know it's the beginning of making our lives with him a bit more balanced. It also will make him safer on the road and when we're with other people at the park or when we're walking down the street, when he learns what it is to listen to me. But I get it. I can really struggle with waiting too, whether it's waiting for the rest of my family to be ready or waiting for the microwave to finish or waiting for the transport to arrive. Sometimes in the morning with a coffee, I'll make a plunger and I'll go and you've got to leave it for about four minutes, but I so desperately want the coffee. I find that sometimes even hard to wait for. And just ask my wife, Rach, I, I really don't um, like leaving others to wait also. I really don't really like being late. And while I don't always achieve it, I do enjoy being early to things, but of course not too early because I don't want to wait, but I don't want others to have to wait for me either. I love thinking of the future. I love strategy. I love thinking ahead. And this means I'll try to think of a present for Rachel early. I hate not knowing what to get her. And I feel great when I find that perfect present that year, but because I love it so much, I often don't want to wait either to give it to her. And sometimes I'll come straight in the door days before her birthday and give it to her. Now, I'm happy to wait for a train or a plane flight if there's something in the meantime I can do, whether it's reading a book or answer some emails or text or play a, a app on my, on my phone that I'm loving, do a Wordle or something, anything that can go give me that sense of achievement, anything that can help me to avoid that sense of waiting. Because to simply slow down and wait is hard. Why am I saying this? We live in a world that changes. We live in a world that has momentum. We've all seen how quickly things can change. The pace of things can stimulate us and inspire us and excite us, but it can also distract us, worry us and exhaust us. Waiting is, is something that technology has tried to remove as much as possible from our lives. Things that used to take ages, we can now get in minutes. And if you're watching this on demand today, you can even skip ahead to see if I get better or to see where this is going. You could even, if it was on a podcast, listen to it at double the speed to get through to the end. And yet through God's word and throughout his history and interaction with creation and with his people, we see his constant call for his people to wait. Listen to these words from the psalmist in Psalm 27, who writes, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. 
All these words from the prophet Hosea, speaking for God, who, who says, but you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. And I could have picked a number of different places from other Psalms to um, passages in Michael or Isaiah or Lamentations and others where God's people are con continually challenged and called to wait, to wait in the Lord. And then there's this one said by Jesus himself to his followers just before he ascends to heaven in Acts, just before he's about to leave them on their own. He says this in Acts 1 verses 4 to 8. He says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It says, they then gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You can hear it in what they're saying. We want to know why we're waiting. We want to know what's next. And he says to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's why you'll be waiting, he says. In every occasion, including this one in Acts, it is clear what we are waiting for. We are waiting for the Lord God. We are waiting for God to act, for his will to be done, for him to lead. And though sometimes it can be, waiting isn't just sitting around. But instead, waiting is a posture of openness, of unhurriedness, of listening. When once asked, how can I be spiritually healthy? The great Christian philosopher Dallas Willard replied, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. There is nothing else. Another author, um, Bill Gatier, boils down Willard's words down further to do not try to make anything happen. This is what waiting on God is all about. We hear it in Hosea's words, return to God, maintain love, maintain justice, but always wait for the Lord. Allow God to be in the driver's seat. And this is what Jesus himself is asking his followers to do in Acts. He has given them the great commission. He has taught them for three years. He has died and he has risen again. He's even sent them out in groups and they've seen incredible things while he was around and now he was about to ascend to the father and he calls them too in this moment to wait to allow god to be in the driver's seat of what is next because the mission is god's work it's his plan and he knows what is best he knows what is best for us he knows what is best for the world he knows what his kingdom looks like in its fulfillment and it's his work that we get to partner in not the other way around and so they needed to wait wait jesus says for the holy spirit for the power of the holy spirit to come upon you Wait for the presence of God manifested. Wait for the Spirit to reveal God's wider mission to all the world in what would be the incredible day at Pentecost where all languages were heard. Wait for God's presence to be evident and, and doing the work and join in with that. You know, when I was a kid, I, I had a number of models in the beginning. I loved models. My brother used to do them. I was fascinated by them. A number of models in the beginning that just never turned out right. Ones that I had been given as a gift. And I didn't know all the tricks that model makers know and really how to put them together well, what needed to happen in the right order and how to do it. My dad and my brother, they both told me each time, just, just wait, wait for them to teach me. But you know, they were often busy and I didn't want to bug them. And I was, as I said earlier, maybe a little impatient too. And I didn't really trust that maybe they were ever going to come and help. And as I said, the result was a disaster. It was a waste of a good model of whoever had bought that or even the money I might have spent myself. It was a waste of that money. 
the product in the end was built on my own inabilities and poor judgment. And you could see it because I didn't have the know-how. I didn't have the understanding. I didn't have the power and the patience to do it on my own. And I learned the hard way that I needed to wait, just as they had said I needed to. You know, so often we don't want to wait. We just want to go ahead in our own power, in our own strength. And in this situation, more than the bad outcome that came when I did that, I missed out on the benefits of being in the presence of my dad and my brother, receiving their wisdom, having quality time with them, getting their perspective and doing things in their knowledge and strength. You know, it's lucky I didn't actually even give up making models. They were so terrible. And somewhere along the line, they stepped in. Somewhere along the line, I waited for them to teach me. You see, waiting is about being with God first and foremost in all things, being open-hearted, being open-handed before him, an inner patience waiting for all that God has for us. Because unlike the model that I spoke before, we don't know what the outcome is like. We don't get our life in a box. Only God truly knows what is best for us. He has plans for us. He only knows, he's the only one who knows what's best for his kingdom. In Luke 10, verse 38 to 42, we read a story of two women, Mary and Martha. And it says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had been made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and you are upset about many things, but few things are needed and indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and it will be not taken away from her. Now in this story, if you've grown up with this story, Martha gets a pretty bad rap. Can you imagine being remembered for all time for this moment? And we read in another account with Martha and Mary in John 11, in a different situation that with their, along with their brother Lazarus, that they were all very close friends to Jesus, that people saw and knew how much he loved them and their family. And according to custom, Martha was probably doing the right thing. She was showing hospitality in her home, and maybe even she was, as a woman, getting out the way to allow Jesus to teach the men who were in her home. This was the culturally right thing to do. And so her complaint against her sister is actually quite understandable. And yet, as Jesus says, Mary in listening at his feet, in choosing to be with Jesus over convention, expectations, duties, and a possibility against culture that she had in fact chosen the better path. You know, often there are those of us who have followed Jesus for a while, and maybe we're a part of a serving community. You know, we can actually, like Martha, use waiting on God. We can choose that over waiting for him. By this I mean Jesus primarily, but we worship Jesus primarily by the things that we do for him. Just as Martha was doing here, instead of worshiping Jesus by stopping, by eliminating hurry, by first waiting, listening, watching, yeah, watching for him. We can make life about the things that we do for him, like Martha. And these things become distractions and they seem like good distractions. We can choose that for our worship instead of simply making room to hear God speak, making room for his presence, making room for him to be king, for him to be center, making room for his, for his will in season and not our will. We choose things that we think worked before rather than listening to what God wants to do now. Rather than making room to sense his leading, to sense what he's wanting to do. We can choose to worship him by waiting on him instead of waiting for him. You know, this is incredibly challenging because it was Jesus himself who said in Matthew 7 that not everybody says to me, who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. He says that many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. What he's saying is here, there will be people who will say, but Lord, I worshipped you by all the things that I did. And Jesus says, that's not what I'm asking from you. I'm asking for you to sit at my feet, to know me. And if you hear condemnation in Jesus' words on the mount, or of condemnation in what he says to Martha, I think that maybe you've missed the point of what Jesus is trying to say here. God wants you. He wants us. He wants each of us to know him. He wants us to be like Mary, to first worship by coming to him, by being with him, by placing his will first in our life. And he has promised in James in the New Testament and Jeremiah in the old, in the old that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. He says, I will be found by you. And he who is promised is faithful, we read in Hebrews. Will you respond to his promise? Will you draw near to him today? Like Martha, it's easy for us in an ever-changing world to be overwhelmed, to be overcome by the pressures of life. But he says to Martha, few things are needed. In fact, only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. better. We hear the incredible truth in Jesus' words. Wait on me. Seek my presence. And when you do so, the priorities of your life will change and they'll land in their rightful place. And more than that, you'll be positioned in my will. You'll be positioned to hear my voice. You'll be positioned to know my strength, to, to know my leading, to know my power. Isaiah 40, God makes this promise in line with this, where he says, even the youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. There will always be a limit to what we can do, to what we can see in our strength, no matter who we are. But God promises that those who wait for him will know something more beyond themselves. They will know what it is to live in God. We see this dramatic and lasting transformation in the first followers in the birth of the church, that in their weakness and as they waited, God by his spirit moved and he gave them strength and he gave them authority. He gave them power. In the waiting, they powerfully joined the move of God, not their own move, but a move of God at the right time. And the world was forever changed. And we live in that legacy. So what does this waiting look like? It's whatever it takes for you, like Mary, to be placed listening at the feet of Jesus. It's like the disciples coming to the end of yourself and only wanting to be led in your next steps by the Lord. It's the desire to only want to remain in his will and in his presence, to only want to do life in his power and alongside him. Waiting is the habits, the habits that humble us before him, the habits that undo the striving that we have to make things happen in our own strength and our own wisdom. It's the habits that allow his spirit to lead, to create, to empower. It's the habits that make room for God. It's the desiring to hear the voice of his spirit in in prioritizing prayer and worship and immersing yourself in prayer as a priority and stopping to hear the voice of his spirit. It's about immersing yourself in his word and allowing the spirit to speak to you about what it's saying to you. It's about listening to the wisdom of those that God has placed in your life to lead you and to teach you and to challenge you. It's slowing down to hear what the Lord might be saying through them. It's pausing to listen And it's eliminating the desire to hurry and to be in control. And maybe it's pausing to wait on God. Instead of doing that thing that we always used to do for God, we choose to be with God in this moment. Shifting that posture to simply wait for him and to know his presence. To be still and know that he is God. You know, incredibly, in his love for us, 
God knows too what it is to wait. David the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord my soul, in all my innermost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and who crowns you with love and compassion. And then in verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. God knows what it is to wait. Because to each of us, he is compassionate and gracious and patient and slow to anger and abounding in love. And yet he is king. But he is the God who wants to include us. He wants to enable a relationship with us. In Revelation 3, we read that he stands at the door of our very lives and knocks and desires to come in and to abide with us. And today, honestly, you might say, look, if you're really honest, I don't actually know God. I don't think I've ever waited on him, taken a moment to be with him. You might be thinking today, really, am I, I might actually be the kind of person Jesus was talking about in his sermon, who's doing all these things, but really just doesn't know God in that kind of relationship. The good news is that today can be different. Today, God has promised that if you draw near to him, He'll draw near to you. That as you slow down, as you take that humble posture, he will meet you here. You see, the psalmist praises the Lord because he knows. He has seen the character of God. And so he says he praises him from his inmost being. And he wants to wait for the God that he knows. Unlike us in our own limitations, God is love itself. He's the good father. He is able He's able to do immeasurably more. His will is good and perfect and complete. He's able and faithful to accomplish what he has promised. He's able to accomplish his plan for the renewal of all things, for the renewal of your life. And so will you wait to draw near to God today? I didn't want just today for me to talk to you about waiting for God, but I wanted you to have a moment to give you the gift of a moment to experience what it is to wait on God. I don't want to just talk about it today. I want us to do this together. And so now as I come to a close, we're going to go to a song. And I want to ask you to just stop. Listen to the song. Close your eyes, maybe open your hands. Take this moment for however long the song goes and say, Lord, I'm here. I'm listening. I want to draw near to you. And as that song comes to a close, I'll lead us in prayer. Awaken my soul. Come away. Through the caverns of my soul, glory 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have promised that when we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. What we see in the cross is that you made us friends even when in our own lives and when humanity was treating you like an enemy, you did what it took to make a way. You ripped that curtain in two and broke the holy of holies and so heaven and earth could meet could meet in our lives by the power of your holy spirit help us lord to wait remind us to wait help us to humble ourselves and to wait and see what you might be doing or saying show us what it is to lean on you and to Wait on you. King Jesus, we thank you that you are at work in this world. And we just want to join you in that place. You are at work in our lives and we just want to be able to recognize that and receive all that you have for us and be changed and molded as you see fit. Lord, we just want to wait on you today. We want to wait on you every day. Lead our steps, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.